applied. I, was, I participated in uh, helping draft the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples at the United Nations. I was, I was able to get involved in that back in the 80s and the 90s. And most of it was already drafted, but there was opposition from the United States, so I was asked by people to go in there and kind of took on the Department of State when they're involved in uh, debates and deliberations as to whether or not this declaration should actually be uh, even uh, considered as a legitimate position that the United States should recognize. Now, uh, that draft declaration has gone around the world now in 2007 when the United Nations approved it. The United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, which are uh, very colonial, uh, had opposed it. Since then, they've reversed their positions and came on board. I'm proud to say that I drafted the original clinical statement that was translated by the Indian Law Resource Center into the legal statement that uh, President Obama used to justify his position for accepting the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. When I was listening to the sister from Celio Falls, those, those are part of the problems that it addresses. It's the rights to have your traditional government, uh, that we don't have to go outside and ask somebody outside the colonial community to say that you are recognized and that you can have a government, and that you can have a community, and that you can have your own form of uh, uh, teachings and song and dance and ceremony and spiritual practices. It's about restoration. And so uh, that's why we sit with the sister because we know that her heart is uh, heavy in regards to uh, the attempts of Salilo Delis to continue to exist. And we know uh, 57 years ago, uh, uh, 1958 on, uh, was the 57th year since 1957 when the Salilo Falls was covered up. You know, and uh, for many people that seems like it's a long time ago, but for Native American communities, we have oral history that stretches anywhere from uh, uh, 200 to 250 years. So that's where a person A tells person B, and person B shares with person C. And so uh, that will stretch that far. Uh, I was up in Spokane, and I was talking to an elder, and he says, uh, at daybreak, and, uh, a Kalispell, actually, and he was the only one up in, uh, very early for coffee, and I went in there, and he's a very big man. And he goes, oh, you want coffee? Oh, they're young fellas. says, go get it and come back here, and I'll talk to you. Uh, I didn't, I must have been on my face. I didn't say I wouldn't have had anybody talk to me or lecture me that early. But I went down, I sat down, and he goes, you know, I was, a, um, I was in World War II. And then I was in Korea. And I retired, and I was heading home, and the state trooper stopped me and said, uh, they called you back, you're going to Vietnam. And uh, this man had a half a sheet of plywood to display his medals. And we don't even know him by name. Half a sheet. He said, uh, that was, these wars are horrible, but, he, but I think it was the most important in a very long discussion. He said, you know, when I was nine years old, my grandparents were 104, 105, because my parents died, they were raising me. And my parents had me very late in life, and my grandparents got me very late in their life. They were afraid because I was so depressed, because I was so, uh, even at the age of nine, I was being beaten up on a regular basis whenever I'd go to town, and uh, because I was Indian, and my grandfather was really afraid for me, so he took me to two elders to get advice. I thought, what? Your grandparents are 104 or 105, where would elders, where would they find out? <laughs> And when he said that, I jumped up because, you know, I have a fast parade, so I went running around and I hugged him. I hugged him and I had tears in my eyes because I was talking to a man that was advised by two people that were alive before Lewis and Clark came through. Mm -hmm. Now, that's oral history. That's why I had a tear in my eye because uh, it was such a valid thing. And, uh, we keep that uh, idea alive, that keeps you alive. Our song, our dance, our cer ceremonies. Our traditional knowledge ties us to the earth. And so in symbology, that's why I really appreciate the young girl getting up and saying, rewrite the story. Uh, uh, she's obviously going to have a great career ahead of her in either politics or law or something. It's obviously, uh, 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 there's a, a large destiny waiting for her. You know, and it's people like you that encourages uh, young people like her to move forward and become acting voices where they're not afraid to stand up in front of podiums and voice their opinion. Now, when the uh, Pope came up with a statement in May, I was really proud, and uh, to tell the truth, I had tears in my eyes because in 1987, uh, that, that apology of churches was because I had just come up from uh, Africa, South Africa, where we're working with 
when Dr. Russo and I were working with the Victoria government to show the uh, uh, white government and the black uh, uh, people how to work together at negotiations and overcoming value conflicts. And so we're doing some special work down there. And during that time, Chernobyl blew. And I was devastated. It seemed like the whole world would held its breath for a second. But as, for, as far as I was concerned, that was not enough. That's not enough. How can this happen? How can we just allow this to happen? How can we be so powerless? And then we went up and seen the black snow in the Swiss Alps and acid rain melting the statues and the river was dead. And, you know, children now couldn't play in the sand because Chernobyl's radioactivity was polluting it. You know, things like that. And so I was pretty upset and we came back and I told my uh, colleague, I said, we don't want to work with the Christian community because uh, they have values that are wrong. They cage, they have dominion. To, to dominate the earth. That's unacceptable. We're Mother Earth people. We need to save our mother. We need to save Father Sky. We've got to stand up for what we believe in. And I was just really angry. And uh, my colleague, uh, who's always cool, collected, uh, rational, <laughs> turned, me, uh, turned me into our elder. He grabbed me out. So the elder said, Well, you know, uh, calm down, young man. You know, and he, he pulled that uh, senior rank. And he, it's uh, by his demand that we wrote a letter. And the uh, Church Council of Greater Seattle responded in, the East, uh, they, in 1987. And I was telling another uh, group that I really didn't believe them, so I took it to the uh, Senate and entered it into the records just in case they don't take action. You know, because words are easy and we're treaty people. And we know that sometimes treaties on wor uh, are words on paper and they're not honored on the other side. And so uh, I thought that's one way to preserve it. But 1997 was signed again, and 2007 was signed again, but we're missing the Catholics in 2007. And so when the Pope came out with his statement in uh, May of this year, I was really encouraged. I, I thought, wow, it's finally, you know, uh, uh, I like the part where you're saying that we said to have dominion, but we were wrong when we forgot to tell you to love and respect the earth. You know, and finally, it was like, uh, like after holding your breath so long, you finally suck in some fresh air. You know, but right away that causes you to think, well, what's going to happen? Where's the action? You know, what's, what will it take? How many, how long will it be before every church in the country will start saying, uh, we believe in God, God gave us the earth, protect it like it was sacred. It's a gift from God. You know, it doesn't take more than that. give us an opportunity and you know the Pope was uh, uh, afraid that it may be too late. We're all afraid it may be too late. You know and, uh, we can't do this alone. None of us can do this alone. You know these uh, these corporations, you're fighting billionaire corporations. You know and they have all the revenues they need. You're out nickel and diming the community to try to get a letter out. You know to try to pay for a phone, to try to get a text or an email out. No, no, but we do have power because we do have emails, we do have Facebook, we do have text message, and we can instantly touch with anybody in the world. It's not like the 80s and before that where you had to write letters and hope it got there. Now, it's there. It's there instantly. So instant communication is a, also a weapon on our side of the equation, not just theirs. And we have numbers. That's the beauty of it. So... When we started the totem pole journeys, at the same time, we are working to try to unite the tribes. And I'm really proud that um, Dr. Russo and I were uh, called by the Loving Nation to help develop their position to deal with the Cherry Point because the corporations were in their whining and dining leadership for the past 15 years, convincing them, just be neutral. Don't worry about it. We're your friend. You know, and uh, uh, when we came on board, we said, no, they're not your friend. And you can't be neutral. you got to say no. Absolutely not. You know, and uh, uh, that's the way our elders would have done it. That's the way all the leaders before you would have done it. And that's the position you got to take. And so they have been taking that position. And I know uh, while we're on the road here, uh, Chairman uh, Timothy Blue came out publicly and said, it's absolutely no. Again, he said, no, we said no and we mean no. And so I'm glad to hear that. Uh, my adopted daughter from Brazil uh, uh, texted me. Uh, see, when we, uh, I'll pray about her. Uh, I worked with her uncle on uh, indigenous things, Roberto Makoshi, and he, or his niece was a translator for the 32 village chiefs of the Amazon. And so uh, we ended up bringing her to the United States, and now she's getting her master's. When she got here, she could only say hi, that's all. 
but now she's uh, becoming a counselor and doing really good. But the thing was is that we all have to find ways, little ways that we can make a difference. Our vision is that she may go back and actually become a leader in the Amazon, not to stay with us, but to go back there and actually assert herself in regards to the great potential. Just like this young lady here, is that we hope to train them so that they have the capacity to stand up and uh, be our voice. And every, every uh, tribe that came together with the Lummi Nation, uh, we had the Tsleil-Waututh, they're fighting Kinder Morgan Pipeline, tar sands oil, and uh, they're going to put it to the Fraser River, and uh, the Fraser River is already uh, dying. And up north, north is the tar sands uh, mines, that's the Beaver Lake Creek. And when we first heard about it, the uh, daughter of Chief Dan George, he was in the movies and everything, a lot of people know him, Chief Dan George was. Uh, uh, great intellectual, great poet, uh, great actor. And uh, anyway, she had tears in her eyes. She goes, I went up there. I didn't believe it. They are dying of cancer. The fish are dying of cancer. The birds are dying of cancer. The animals are dying of cancer. The people are dying of cancer. And she was crying. She goes, they, there's two girls fighting for the rights of their people. And they threw one of the sisters off the 33rd floor. She goes, uh, but her sister will not stop. You know, and, uh, so these people that are up there battling, uh, you know, they're small people. They don't have funds. They don't have access to massive technology. What they do is they have friends that they reach out to. And you're their friend as much as more of their friend. Because what we're trying to do is link Beaver Lake 3 with Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, uh, Tsleil-Waututh is connected with us. The uh, Salish, the Salish are part of the affiliate tribe of the Northwest Indians of Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, Southeast Alaska, Northern California. And we always have a big say on the National Congress of American Indians in regards to these type of issues in the Pacific Northwest. We formed uh, uh, signed proclamations with the Yakimas and the, uh, the Northern Cheyenne, the Alwas and the Quinaults and the Swinomish and the Tsleil-Waututh Nation. Yeah, we will stop the coal. We will stop the tar sands. And the way we believe at Lummi is that we can't come to you and ask you for your help and then not help in return. You know, that's the way our, our people teach us is that when they come forward and help you, and then you've got to remember that because they basically paid the debts. And now you have to pay the debt back. And so that's what we uh, believe uh, we're doing is that we're going out uh, when we're calling for everybody to unite. All the citizens, all the non-governmental organizations, the interfaith community, uh, we're asking all of you to join with the tribes, that we all join with you, and that we continue to unite with the mayors. The last two mayors I heard today and yesterday, those are great. That's fantastic position. Those are great personalities. during the 200 year celebration of the U.S. Constitution said, thank you, Iroquois and Choctaw Confederacies for teaching us our sovereignty. We're showing us how that you are role models for our form of constitutional government. They're talking about popular sovereignty. What is popular sovereignty based on? You got a mind, body, and soul. They all work together. And the mind and body get addicted to the world, and that's where you become selfish and materialistic. But hopefully the soul will guide you to a more proper free will, free choice. That's going to be a, more of a blessing in line with God's creation. Well, when you join all those souls together, uh, you become we the people. And Tom Sampson told us about this totem pole because it, it has symbols that are important to the uh, Northern Cheyenne. Uh, but every pole, that we, uh, like the one we put up in Beaver Lake Creek, and then we put, and we had one up at Salaver Tooth. Now we're going to Otter Creek, and the Otter Creek of the Northern Cheyenne said, "You come here, you ask for our support, but you don't leave anything. You don't bring anything here. You just ask for prayers. You know, come back with prayers, and bring some support because we're way out here. Nobody's hearing us. And the local media doesn't want to cover our story, and so we need help. And so we're bringing this totem pole there." And then next year, after we bust up with Dr. Phil Lane, we're going to bring one to Yankton Sioux because last year we went to the Yankton Sioux and the Sioux territory because Keystone Pipeline is the other route out of um, the tar sands. So it's tar sands, it's open pit coal mines, and it's between here and there. It isn't going to be a super site. You know, I see different estimates where they're saying that one ton of uh, particulates will fall off the train. Okay, the other one I see was out of 156 trays, 500 pounds will fall off each train. 
Now that's a huge difference, but even at the lower amount, one ton per train, whether it's nine or 38, if all three ports were authorized, it'd be 38 train loads coming through, dropping 38 tons a day. Do the math, that's a super site. And it's all arsenic, and it's all mercury, and it's all going into your children's water. I think we all have this uh, vision in our minds that you can just go dive in the river, you can dive in the lake, and feel the freedom. But you wouldn't want your children to do it now because it's poison. You know, the waters uh, now, uh, lakes and ponds and, and even rivers are getting so warm that the uh, benthic organisms, the little one-cell amoebas are getting so thick that they're a health risk if you let your children go in there. And so it's not only killing salmon, but it's uh, something you can't drink. You know, and so the world is uh, uh, being challenged by, all, uh, by uh, industry and it's up to us to defend it. We had Fawn Sharp, she's the president of Quinault Nation and also the affiliate tribe of Northwest Indians, uh, up with us at Longview. And she's, she's a young woman that was raised on the Quinault Nation under the leadership of her mother and other tribal leaders, went on to be a lawyer. And she, she's out there internationally defending our, our position on global warming. She wants to do everything she can to help stop global warming. You know, and uh, at times she has to come home and her people don't hear the whole voice, but they keep her putting her back in because she's doing a good job. Those, that's important that every leader, uh, whether you're a mayor, or you're a tribal leader, or a governor, like Governor of Oregon standing up saying, well, I'm not going to give you the permit. You know, those are big times. Those are big decisions. You know, and uh, that's the type of decision making we need to see in this day and age because we all have or will have grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I really love that poem that you read. And, uh, you know, I, I say, wow, we have birds and mammals and uh, reptilians on this pole. It's like the, the story, it really fit. But we're going to bring this totem pole to um, Arter Creek, because Arter Creek will be the biggest uh, pole strip mine in the United States if it's not stopped. And the Northern Cheyenne asked for help. When we get there, we're going to do some blessing ceremonies. We're going to transfer it because the Northern Cheyenne traditionalists and the ranchers have an alliance. And they're going to take it on another three-week journey to build up more support. So thank you for having us here. It's a great honor and a great uh, privilege. And uh, we hope that we'll continue to work together. Hi,